Hello, everyone, and welcome to Give Day at UC Davis. Um, my name is Veronica Hoagland, alongside my colleague Michelle Hicks, and we are coming to you from Advancement Services at UC Davis. Um, we are thrilled to be here with you today. So um, I'm going to walk you through our agenda really quickly, and then we'll jump right into our presentation. So first, we're gonna talk a little bit about UC Davis, and then we will walk you through our give day and how we handled it here. Um, and then Michelle is going to jump in and talk to you about the technical pieces of give day and lessons we learned and what we will be doing this year. Um, but what we really want you guys to know is this presentation is for everyone. Um, whether you have never done Give Day before and you're looking for ideas, or you've done it for several years and you're kind of just looking to see what other people are doing. Um, but ultimately, we're hoping you're able to glean something new from today's presentation and you're able to take it back to your shop and hopefully make your life a little easier. So here we go. A little bit about UC Davis. Uh, UC Davis is a public land grant institution with about 35,000 students across all campuses here in California. Uh, we have a nationally renowned uh, School of Medicine and School of Nursing and a world-class School of Veterinary Medicine. We also um, have a College of Agricultural and Environmental Science uh, which is uh, one of the top programs in the world. Uh, we are a diverse community and committed to inclusion. We were the first UC uh, campus to capture non-binary gender bio data for our alumni donors and friends in our donor database of record, which is called Advance. In 2018, we met the requirements to be eligible for Hispanic serving institution status and that means that the student population has enrolled 25% of its domestic undergrads for economically disadvantaged populations. So in 2016, we launched the quiet phase of our second campaign and took a little bit of a different approach to it this time around. Instead of organizing it according to the usual development areas or capital projects, our leadership decided instead to structure it on the concept of big ideas. Big ideas are forward-thinking, interdisciplinary projects that align with the strengths of the university to positively impact the world. So these projects align more with our institutional reach rather than just our region. Also, they don't quite fit the criteria for the traditional funding agencies due to their highly interdisciplinary nature. And we see these as a wonderful opportunity for donors who wish to further social and scientific causes that UC Davis research community is uniquely positioned to address. The interdisciplinary nature of big ideas does not just apply to the research projects. It also extends into our database of records since each of these big ideas are funded via many different development areas and allocations. We built a suite of award-winning campaign reporting dashboards that reflect these complex structures. And that's a whole nother story. Um, please let me know if you'd like more information on that and we can send it along to you. So a little bit about UC Davis development specifically. We at Advancement Services are part of DVAR, Development and Alumni Relations. With Sean Keister as our fearless leader and 300 plus staff members, our hybridized uh, fundraising environment is complex and dynamic. So we call ourselves the Cousteau Crew because that's the street name of where our office is located. Uh, so right here, you can see a photo of all of us safely viewing the 2017 solar eclipse. And yes, we wear our nerd with pride. <laughs> um, we are four distinct teams, the business intelligence team, these talented 
programmers produce all the things with all the data and develop the products that our Canvas partners need to do fundraising. And then our customer services team, this team consists of our help desk, our system trainers, and our team of business relationship managers who act as liaisons between our business intelligence team and our stakeholders across campus. And then we have our gift and data services. Um, this team is a dedicated gift experts uh, who use our award-winning gift reporting entry and tracking system known as GREAT. Uh, this team pr processes and receives gifts and keeps our data clean, uh, both on an individual and meta level. And then last but not least, our gift policy and ex executive support team. It consists of our scrum master, our gift agreements group, and our executive support and strategy folks. So here's our org chart. Um, we are a pretty big group, and I know the titles and names are a little bit difficult to read because they're so small but we've color coded them to reflect the different teams involved in gift day, which I'll talk about in just a bit. And to give you a little bit of, of an idea of the amount of work we do each year, here are a few metrics that we measured for fiscal year 19. We completed more than 59,000 gift transactions, which resulted in a fundraising year of $234 million in total. Uh, our average gift processing time uh, was about three and a half days, which is possible in part due to our centralized gift processing system. Great. We also do a lot of project work for our partners across campus, and each year we complete about 50 large projects deemed to be the most important by our organization. And we also handle a lot of day to day business. Uh, we handled more than 14,000. 500 individual service requests. So many tickets. Um, <laughs> Advance is our system of record and we manage just over 1 million entities um, in our donor database. Uh, and that just happened recently. So we have blown uh, the 1 million mark. And we also support the separate systems which are uh, support all of our campus partners. So in other words, that's kind of a lot of work. How do we manage all of this without going completely bonkers? We are agile. So how do we work? Um, we use agile here at UC Davis, but some of you might be asking what exactly that means. And that can be difficult to describe because the way we do Scrum is constantly evolving. It's not prescriptive, and it's meant to be interpretive. Also, Agile isn't one thing, it's three. So it's a framework for getting things done. It's a value system and a process. And we lean much more on the Agile value system than we do in any particular framework or processes we derive from it. And by the way, if you're interested, the article reference tier for this explanation is one of the best explanations I've read. So here at Advancement Services, we have three main areas of operation. Gift processing, ad hoc data requests, and priority project work. Each of these areas have their own scrum board. It's where the work lives, and it's divided into tasks that are easily consumable. That's what all the post-its represent. Using this framework has proven to be highly efficient and productive way of managing our workload. And it's conducive to the many types of projects, including those that involve data science. So Agile is a value system. Um, these four bullets are taken from the Agile Manifesto, but essentially the value system of, of Agile project management is based on the idea that the team agrees to do the work and what is actually happening and not blindly stick to a plan we had laid out at the beginning. There are always unknown unknowns in any project. Um, and being agile means being flexible enough to respond to these unknowns in a way that adds value to the project. It's also about not coding yourself into a corner by making all the decisions before you begin and being forced to either scrap the whole thing or make your business fit within that confinement. It's about believing in your team and providing a space of psychological safety from which they can voice concerns and offer alternatives. 
Agile development isn't anti-documentation. It isn't anti-spending most of your time updating documentation that will never be complete. And it's also not just random iteration either. In the context of data science, Agile teams test their requirements against the reality of the systems that they're working with. And at the end of each sprint, they review what they've discovered and plan next steps using those insights. So when it comes to agile processes or ceremonies, as they're known in the official lingo, uh, we apply these robustly to how we work. I could go on for a day about all of these different processes, but essentially we do all of our work in two sprints. Most projects take longer than two weeks to complete. But doing the work in increments like this and then checking in together as a team to determine next steps, that's the, really the definition of what it means to be agile. We also have analysts, managers, and application programmers who fill essential roles in this process. And we have our scrum master who's like our station master who keeps things on the rails. And then we have our scrum teams, which are the groups of applications programmers working only on the part of the project that they're doing in that two-week sprint. And then we have our product owners slash business relationship managers who are our business to system translators. So who are business relationship managers and product owners? We have a dual role here for these positions because our business model is one of the blend of a agile practices and ITIL incident management processes. So for those of you who would like to know more about our business relationship managers, please let me know. We have another whole presentation about this team. Uh, the primary objective of business relationship management is to maintain positive relationships with the customers. According to ITIL, the BRM process is responsible for identifying the needs of existing and potential customers and ensuring that appropriate services are implemented to meet those needs. The product owner is a member of the Agile team responsible for defining stories and prioritizing the team backlog to streamline the exec execution of program priorities while maintaining the conceptual and techni technical integrity of the features or components for that team. Our product owners slash business relationship managers are assigned a portfolio of internal customers. Those, those schools and units across campus who use our systems and rely on us to get the data they need to do their fundraising. Their customers exclusively work with them on their request for the data and over time they become experts in the business needs of those customers. Our BRMs also work closely with our delivery team and application programmers while they are fulfilling a customer's request and act as a bridge or QA gate and the boundary between our customers and our delivery team. As such, they give our programmers time to, to be who we need them to be. Our business relationship managers provide the business context, the questions, the why, so that our programmers can more quickly get to what and the how. They are particularly important in this context because they take care of all the business side of Give Day, which allows our programmers to build the tools we need. So in 2019, uh, we hosted our third Give Day as part of Picnic Day, which is a celebration of who we are and how our work contributes to the global community. It's a 29 hour event and Give Day here at UC Davis is more than just a large scale solicitation. It's a social media movement fueled by a robust communication strategy and the relationships we've, we've built with our leadership level donors who sponsor challenge gifts. In order to serve the needs of our campus partners, the Annual and Special Gifts Program team, and ensure our donor uh, experience worthy of this celebration, every team within Advancement Services works together to keep the gift and donor data pieces moving. Really, really big pieces. And using a giving platform that's not connected to our internal gift and data management ecosystem adds another layer of complexity. These facts mean that we've had to rely on flat file exports, bulk fund transfers from holding accounts, 
and white knuckle grit to correctly transfer these gifts into our systems, advance and break. So each year, Give Day uh, generates our largest solicitation data pool and the highest daily volumes of gifts received. The biggest test of our entity matching system and our longest running project. In addition to Give Day's past, we experienced challenges with other high gift volume campaigns, one of which occurred in response to a natural disaster. We knew we needed to be better able to handle such situations. So this year, with many lessons learned under our belt, we finally cracked the code on Give Day at Advancement Services. Matching, batching, and dispatching more than $2 million from over 4,000 individual gifts in less than two weeks. ScaleFunder is the platform that we use for Give Day and we continue to use. Once, uh, one of the nice features is that um, donors are immediately tax receipted after gifts are made and we at Advancement Services are able to export a wall of data from the platform to either appropriately match, create entities, batch monies for upload into our alumni and donor database of record advance. So our 2019 Give Day was our third and we have had a lot along, we've learned a lot to be honest along the way. So the first year to put things plainly was crazy pants. We had a lot, um, we had just launched our new centralized gift processing system and Give Day was a new thing for all of us at UC Davis. It took a long time to sort through and process gifts, but as I mentioned, the, this really taught us a lot of lessons and including what we needed to do to help our centralized gift processing system manage with these sorts of crowdfunding initiatives. The second year, uh, we nicknamed the year of Humpty Dumpty, referring to the fate of the data and gift information that we received from ScaleFunder. I think that the second year was probably our biggest learning opportunity for um, us because we had to shift from our regular way of working on projects. And as I mentioned earlier, we are an agile shop. So this means many things. Um, but one of the things it really means is that when we, something needs to get done, we all pitch in to help. We thought it'd be a good idea to split the original scale funder data set into different pieces and work on them in groups. But however, we learned uh, towards the end of it all that the divide res really resulted in less conquer. It was more important to keep the data sets intact rather than split them up in amongst teams. And we ultimately uh, did conquer our second give day and it went a lot faster and more smoothly than our first. But our third give day is when we really knocked it out of the park. So yeah, there were a lot of challenges to our give day um, gift gift days over the years, um, but one thing remained constant. The data file from ScaleFunder produced at the end. This file was a spreadsheet that contained donor bio and gift data, and it was literally the key to mapping data between systems and ensuring our money ended up in the right benefiting accounts. So each year we've gotten better and better at working with the data set, but last year we really we got it, we, we crushed it. And given our past experiences, we were able to better anticipate the challenges we'd face during our third year. And that allowed us to address them well in advance of the event itself. And all of the challenges centered on a core issue, how to accurately merge GIFs and data from one external system to our other systems. Advanced, great, quality, our accounting system. So, um, and this wasn't just a few gifts, it was thousands at once. So this meant we need to figure out how to find existing donors um, via our entity matching system. So we didn't bloat our system with duplicate records or miss opportunities to enhance our donors giving records. Then we had to enter thousands of gifts into our system of record using our centralized gift processing uh, system, great. Then convert all the scale funder receipts from an email we were CC'd on to a PDF and upload it as a gift receipt to each corresponding gift. Then move the correct amount of money to the correct benefiting unit counts. And then leverage the Give Day donor contact data by 
uploading worthy data to the records in advance and not just dumping it into the database to cause bloat. Because we addressed these technical um, issues over the course of the year prior, uh, we were able to process the $2 million from over 4,000 donors in two weeks. So in the latter half of each year, we participate in Give Day Steering uh, Committee meetings and we review and ensure uh, units are turning in their challenge forms, um, the annual and special gift team approves, and then we ensure to have the chosen fund uh, we can actually solicit for and promote. Uh, language is okay uh, when talking about the fund. And then we coordinate gifts when donors want to give early. So we wanna make sure their gift counts on give day. Um, so if someone's on vacation and can't make it that day, um, we, we record their gift and get it ready for it to count on give day. We ensure minimums are adhered to and create challenges and all challenges are fulfilled at the end, which donors are made aware of and even challenges are not met, um, they cannot be revoked. Um, so in December, we start collecting specs for our data pools for direct mail and email from our partners in annual and special gifts. Um, at this point, our role is to provide data uh, based on their specifications. Uh, and then direct mail begins in February and email begins in March. So we're also, we also start reviewing our playbook and uh, we've already started from the year past updating dates from last year. And this is what we call the Give Day Kickoff Meeting, where all the key players in advancement services are called together uh, to determine the sequence of events and assign accountability. So in summary, in February, we start reassessing all new stories we need to execute. Um, in March, we start development work uh, on the stories to put forth. In April, we test money flow through ScaleFunder and double confirm allocations, make sure they're all active and not inactive. We assist on the day of providing uh, tech support and gift intake and ensure donor intent is being honored. Um, and then Give Day happens. And in May, we process and record all Give Day gifts and report out final numbers. And this includes identifying donors that already exist in Give Day um, in our database, I'm sorry, uh, creating entities who are new, batching gifts into advance, and uploading PDF receipts to Great, and moving money to their final destination. Once every receipt is recorded and the BRM and a dedicated application programmer works in Power BI to craft a final report for leadership. All right, so that was a lot of work. I just talked about what happened over the course of a year, and it's a lot to keep track of as we're going through this presentation. So what we did is we created a Give Day play map as a visual representation of all the different people and pieces that make Give Day happen. Um, and as you can see, there are a lot of advancement services teams that work on each aspect of Give Day. So now we're going to go and dive into each of those teams and their tasks in detail. So let's talk teams. Um, first, there is the customer service team. Uh, this is my team, and they are the bridge between delivery teams, application programmers, and the schools and units we support. Uh, for Give Day, there are several business relationship managers who play key roles in ensuring to keep the train on the tracks. Then we have our solicitation data team, and these are the application programmers that code requests and provide vendor outputs, meaning solicitable populations in an Excel spreadsheet, and bucket them into appropriate segments, and provide gift arrays and scan lines for the vendor. And these files can be up to half a million rows of data. The gift and data services team, this is Michelle's incredible team. Uh, they are the workhorse of the organization, focusing on processing gifts and ensuring donor intent. Uh, please note this team also includes student helpers and Michelle will elaborate uh, more on that in a bit. And then last but not least, we have our coding team. This is our business intelligence team who built all of the tools which help us validate and process all of the data associated with the gifts that we received. 
So uh, to go into a little bit more detail about each team, um, the customer service team who are also product owners and business relationship managers uh, led the charge and served both as the project managers and the liaisons between our campus partners and our delivery teams. They also coordinated with our gift acceptance experts to ensure that all of the challenge gifts were in compliance with policy. Um, this team was also responsible for creating the playbook and calling everyone together, all the key players involved, all the decision makers, um, to come up with uh, the pieces and the parts to make up the approach to get something in writing and something for us to follow. So um, what does a playbook consist of? It's essentially any action item that we need to complete in order to process gift day. And why was it important? It was created out of necessity. Um, we needed a single place for multiple teams to reference at any time or place and know when and what they were accountable for. So first, our first approach was a RACI. Um, it was designed to be detailed and really tactical and to make sure everyone knew what they were accountable and responsible for. However, the verdict was, it was so-so, okay, eh. um, It was too detailed, essentially. So we tried a different approach the following year. We played it, we tried a playbook, and the great thing about this was we knew when we needed to do something. We needed, we knew what to do and who was accountable, and also important details about the task. So that meaning, like, we could take notes, and if something worked or didn't work, um, we could say, hey, this is good for next year, let's put it here so we can make playbook for the next year um, really easily. We also knew there was a single accountability indicator, so we knew who was accountable and to go to who for what in case something um, was behind or somebody had a question, needed clarification. And then also this uh, playbook functioned like a project milestone map. So we could see like where exactly we were at a certain time if leadership needed to know what was going on. Everyone knew who was on the project, when and where. So I'm going to do a little comparison about our RACI um, versus the playbook really fast. So the RACI matrix uh, was a responsibility assignment chart um, that mapped out every task, milestone, and key decision involved in completing the project. Uh, we assigned roles, um, who was responsible, accountable, and consulted informed. For the playbook, it uh, became a list of just simple tasks with dedicated people assigned to each task, and it was super easy to follow. So bottom line, um, I asked the team to vote and on um, which one they preferred, and the team preferred the playbook. So that is how we proceeded and won. Next up is the solicitation data team. Uh, this team managed the data needed by our campus partners to segment about 600,000 households and a number that would fill Dodger Stadium 10 times over. Can you imagine? Um, usually there is about a week, entire week of data review to ensure the population gift raise and print funds are tipped and tied. But um, this team managed the data uh, and really did a fantastic job. Um, they used a combination of just-in-time uh, SQL scripts and a web application we call the ASGP Toolkit to extract data elements needed for email and direct mail pieces, um, which we ended up sending to a few hundred thousand uh, household deemed most likely to give. And a little side note about this, uh, we ended up breaking our shared drive server, literally, IT had to step in and fix it. It was kind of funny, but not at the same time. So here's, an, uh, here's a kind of an example of our give site and what we do when we send our direct mails out is we have uh, links. Also our email pieces, we have links to our give site. And this is what our site, uh, an example of what our site looks like. Um, these are examples from this year. Um, as 
we've unfortunately retired all of our 2019 pieces, but they are very, very similar. So next up, um, Michelle Hicks is going to walk us through how the gifts team and coding teams contributed to this project. All right, Michelle, take it away. And now for the gifts team. During the quiet phase, the gifts team made sure our payment processor was configured appropriately, as well as they partnered with the coding team for full regression testing to ensure all our systems and tools were fully functional. Now, most of the gifts team work took place during the time and during the time and immediately after gift day, but the team also played a role in partnering with all of the challenge gifts for gift day by ensuring that all the challenge gifts were in compliance. I'm going to go into greater detail about how Gifts team manages the processing in just a bit. So the coding team did a lot of work to set us up for success for Gift Day, and much of this was developed and tested well before Gift Day, in some cases months before. These tools facilitated the transfer of information and money generated in ScaleFunner to our internal systems. The four main applications in Give Day were the receipt upload application, we built um, that one in-house. The entity matching system, we had two applications that work together. One is from a vendor and another one is built in-house. Our contact data loader application, we built that, that to help avoid bloating our database with bio data we already have. And our bulk gift uploader, an extension of our centralized gift processing system, great. Now this application that Rowan Taco built for us, it was actually one of her first automation tools after she started with us at Advancement Services. It reads each individual email in a dedicated inbox that we set up to receive common copies of the automated e-receipts that ScaleFunder sends. It then finds the scale funder ID and then matches it to one that's part of the gift record in Great's ecosystem. Then from that found gift record, the application saves the receipt as a PDF and then attaches it to the gift, thus being it available for our external uh, um, users in, that utilizes advanced and our in the Great system. The Scalefunder ID was a unique identifier that we include in all of our gift records. So the key here was connecting our external documents to our internal systems. We use Entity Match a lot in advancement services, and we have many different ways that perform Entity Match in different areas. But the concept is pretty much the same when we have different inputs, such as our emissions load and also our online giving. So we built an amazing entity matching program in Ad Advancement Services. We used a combination of in-house code and vendor solution to help us find as many gift day donor entity records as we can. We need the entity matching system because we do not collect advanced IDs in ScaleFunder. We only get donor and gift information from the donors themselves. It is also really easy to make mistake one entity for another, especially if they did not enter their bio data exactly as it held in advance. For example, you can see here from this example, there are three A. Gonzaleses who have the same address, but different birth dates. How do you know which is which? That's where our entity matching system comes in to assist. Our coding team has been working on our entity match system for a while, but it was really refined for this give day. We're able to get reliable advanced entity matches for about 70% of our give day donors and an additional 15% of our partial matches. Like this in the application that our coding team built before the past give day, but we enhanced it for give day. This application allows us to put to good use the contact bio data that our give day donors provided to us. Say that they were able to match a donor on a name and phone number, but the address data he provided on his give day gift was different from what we had in advance. 
the contact data loader would consume that data, check it against current and past address data, and decide on whether or not that this new information would be an improvement on the entity record. As you can see, by that schematic, we use it for a lot of other mass data loads, and each one might have specific business rules, but we have programmed it to accommodate it, them all. So instead of writing runaway code each time, we have a new entity data upload. We now have a system that is ready. Now the bulk batch tool gave us the ability to batch multiple entries to get batches in advance, rather than going onto each single entry to batch for processing. Even though this tool was created for gift day, the GIFS team is still using this tool for other types of GIFS and grades. Here's what our Give Day processing timeline and workflow looks like. Give Day processing took us about two weeks last year. The first week we spent matching. The second week we spent batching the match GIFS and then dispatching or moving the monies from our holding account into our benef benefiting unit, excuse me, rather accounts. We did that using the tools that I just went over. If you look closely at this slide, we've indicated the handoff of the data from one team to another. This is probably the single most beneficial business process improvement we made last year. And it was completely independent of all the withbangery we created. Remember Humpty Dumpty data sets Veronica talked about earlier? Well, the handoff process took care of that issue. We moved the data set between teams and coordinated green light goes for each of the phases of our processing, which was where also being tracked in our give day playbook, the one Veronica talked about earlier too. So let's take a more detailed look at these steps. Say what is matching, the gifts in week one and batching and dispatching in week two and what those mean. What it really means is a relay race. Focus on holistic file holding. No Humpty Dumpty um, created, and that Humpty Dumpty created boundaries for teams. So therefore, with having this holistic file holding, it was a seamless handoff. And we also learned that divide and conquer didn't work in this case. Now, for give day processing, the matching, the customer service team partners with the coding and gifts team to prepare the file. The first step is to review the gift allocations to make sure the gift funds are still active and follow donor intent. Because ScaleFunder provides a comment box, we review all comments to assist with entity matching and also uphold donor intent. Once that is complete, the file is passed on to the coding team where they are running that file to our entity matching program as mentioned before. And then for the entities that we did not match through our program, then they are, those entities are created in advance and then returned as a new ID for that file. Now that we have identified or created new entities, the coding team has the file prepared for upload in our centralized gift process system, great. In order for us to upload in mass, we reconfigured the bulk uploader tool and the bulk batch tool, as I mentioned before. Now, the bulk uploader tool, a function we created for our very first gift day, has the ability to upload CSV files and create gift entries in great for each row from that file. Both these tools eliminate the need to create and batch entries on a per entry basis manually. Because our gift day file is quite large, we break down the file to five to seven smaller files for upload to not bog down our great system. At this point, the uploader files are passed off to the GIFs team where the files are uploaded into great using the bulk uploader tool as mentioned in previous slides. Now that the, now that the files are now GIF entries in great, the next step is to review and organize the different flavors of GIFs. The first type are the no touches or the simple gifts, which represents about 80% of the file. Now the no touches are gifts with 
no comments or no tributary donors or nothing that needs further review from the gifts team. And the other 20% of the file does require a member of the gifts team for further review. Just ensure that the correct tributary donor or the comments have been reviewed or the gifts that may require gift acceptance policy review. We wanted to make sure we have additional eyes on those. Once those types are identified, the bulk batch tool is used to batch the no touches in advance. Now these batches are then automatically closed and locked for processing. No more human intervention. And then the tool is used again to batch the other type. The gifts team um, has a processing party on two weeks after um, gift day, and it's on a Saturday. And what we do is we process the remaining gifts, reviewing all the comments and the tributary donors information to ensure everything looks okay. And then finally, they are then batched and closed and logged for processing. For the financial review and upload, GRADE is programmed to move money through our financial system. Our partners in accounting perform their final reviews and approvals before the money is dispersed to the final accounts. And finally, the receipts are attached to the to great using the receipt, up, receipt upload tool I mentioned before. Because of the work of the coding team, the gifts team does not have to worry about receipts attaching to each great entry. In turn, the receipt becomes readily available to our internal users. And for final reporting, the coding team produces this beautiful Power BI report for our partners in annual special giving program. This report specifically shows the funds the gifts are allocated to, the total number of donors and dollars, as well as other drill down pie charts and graphs that tell a better story on the success of Give Day. But before we can deliver this bright, shiny report to ASGP, the customer service team and the gifts team audits the gifts to make sure that the correct Give Day codes are applied to the correct gift. So I'm going to wrap things up here for a few lessons learned from our experience. I know that we have a number of systems that are unique to us, so I'm going to focus some time of the process strategies that I know could be useful no matter what size shop or give day you have going on. The first thing is I want to say that it's important to have your process well documented. It is your first, if it is your first time, or if you have not had much time to plan a process in advance, then I say track what you've done um, as meticulously as you can. It's not possible to improve upon something that you cannot see or measure. So it's a real help for, to your future self to be able to review both successes and failures. If you would like more information on how we created our Give Day playbook or play map, please reach out to us via email. The next thing I want to suggest involves Agile. I know that many shops are going full Agile is not really viable on short notice. But we feel that there are a few Agile principles you can apply to your Give Day project that will help a lot. The first thing is multitasking and the idea of dividing and conquering your attention, your time between tasks. And in, the, in, and in this case, also your original data set, keep, in, keep it intact and allow the appropriate team members to work on it, a group at a time if possible. Agile project management methodologies are really all about structuring your work in a way that allows people to focus for chunks of their time on their top priorities, one at a time. So while we all might feel like we're doing more work when we multitask, that doesn't mean that we're producing more. It just means we're working harder. Also, multitasking um, not only creates waste, it also bad for you. I've linked a really interesting article below if you want to look at some of the research that's come out lately about it. Okay, another really important agile co concept of, is that of radical transparency. When it comes to projects like this, when volume is big, is a big challenge, 
is to ditch the information silos and foster an environment of psychological safety that will allow your team to truly feel comfortable asking for what they need and okay with raising a hand if something's going wrong. No shaming and no blaming. One way to do this is to create a playbook for all your team so everyone knows what's happening when, who's going to do the work, and why it's important. That gives everyone a sense of belonging and improves the level of trust between team members. Now, the next thing is batch your gifts into like categories. Whatever that means for your shop. For us, we created batch such as match donor, no tribute, unknown donor with tribute. We all assign batches of similar gifts to individuals or small teams that, yep, you guessed it, that wouldn't have to multitask or switch context too much between the kinds of gift processing processes that you would need to employ based on the gift type. Given that, I'd also, I would also start with your lowest hanging fruit first. Do the easy ones first. Give your teams a sense of accomplishment and it will provide motivation to tackle the ones that take a little more time to process. I will say this though, of those two batches I mentioned before, the unknown donor and with tribute information with the batch category that gave us the most headaches year after year, it makes sense to think about how you're going to handle tributes well in advance of the go live date. Finally, with your gift acceptance books to, to ensure that any large pledges or even small donations are in compliance, that also means to develop good relationships with your campus partners. It's really a win-win-win situation for your donors, your campus partners, and you. There are so many, many more things I could say on this slide, but I'm just going to leave it there for you all. Thank you so much for your attention and feel free to drop us a line if you have any questions. Thank you.